Thanks for that introduction and for the warm greeting from Avenue, and good morning to everyone. I'm glad and grateful to be here today, so early in my tenure as police commissioner. And this, is, this is actually my, uh, my second speech. No, this is not my first speech. The first one was out in Australia. I just got back on Saturday night. New York. There you go, Bill. Actually, you can understand me here. I don't, I don't know if they got my New York ex accent all the way out in Adelaide. I'm glad and grateful to be here today, so early in my tenure as police commissioner because of the essential role, role played by Abney in the life of the city since it was founded by Bill's dad during the fiscal crisis 40 years ago. Now recently I've been thinking about my career and what's transpired since I first joined the New York City Transit Police back in, way back in January 1983. I started out riding the subways from 8 at night until 4 in the morning, learning how the city breathed and moved, learning about the people that make up this great city. And on my last day in uniform, three and a half weeks ago, I rode the trains again, this time with Commissioner Bill Bratton on his next to last day as police commissioner. So, Commissioner Bratton, and there's a couple things in this world I'll never be able to do, it, and one of those is probably called Commissioner Bratton Bill. But, uh, Commissioner Bratton, thank you for doing that with me on the last night. <laughs> It's certainly one of the greatest honors in my life to be named Commissioner of the NYPD. And it's been an equally great honor for me that I've been able to spend my entire poli police career in New York City, watching this place we all love so much grow and improve in so many ways. By the time I had a few years under my belt and had been promoted to Sergeant in the Transit Police, David Dinkins had been elected mayor, so... <laughs> Mr. Mayor, thanks for being here this morning. Mayor Dinkins instituted his Safe Streets, Safe Cities program. He knew that we needed more police officers at the time. He was able to hire thousands more, thousands more cops to expand the city's force. Mayor Giuliani was elected when I was a lieutenant, and I'd started to understand what being a leader was all about. We were accountable for our own actions, for the actions of the men and women who worked so hard under us, and for every single crime that occurred in the subway. Under Mayor Giuliani, Commissioner Bratton devised ComStat a revolutionary method of tracking crime that was invaluable in showing us how and where we could best use our resources. I just thought about it this morning. I've actually been going to ComSat since 1996. It's a little bit more than 20 years going to uh, every Thursday morning, spending quality time with uh, all the men and women in this great police department. After 9-11, when I was commander of the 25th Precinct in Harlem, Mayor Bloomberg and Commissioner Kelly carried on our work with Comstat and went even further by forming a large, well-equipped unit that is widely considered the foremost city counterterrorism bureau anywhere in the world. And we've prevented numerous planned attacks on New York since then. Mayor de Blasio also recognized that in order for us to move forward, the NYPD had to evolve and come up with newer, even better methods of keeping this great city safe. We put cutting-edge technology in the palm of every police officer's hand spending hundreds of millions on that technology and other equipment that helps us do our jobs more effectively and, most importantly, more safely. And for the first time in a dozen years, working with the mayor and the city council, we've added new police officers, approximately 1,300 more cops to our roles. As Commissioner Bratton often pointed out, the NYPD has received everything it's asked from this mayor. And I can tell you, no other city on earth has made more of an investment in keeping the public and its cops safe. So as I look back upon the span of my career, I see that in the last two get decades, serious crimes have dropped more than 75 percent and murder more than 80 percent. During that same time, New York City's population rose by more than a fifth and ridership in our subways nearly doubled. On any given weekday, the subway system that was my training ground now sees an average of more than six million riders and just six reported index crimes. That's one crime a day per one million riders. So thank you, Joe Fox, for that. <laughs> it 
Citywide, this September was the safest of any September in the entire Comstat era, with total index crimes reported down 12.1 percent from September 2015. We've been achieving these kinds of results on a regular basis, both in crime and in time categories. The lowest robbery, burglary, and auto theft numbers since the mid-1960s, the lowest murder since 1957, the safest summer in more than 20 years. What has happened with murders and shootings in the past three years is particularly striking. The three-year average for murders is 36 percent lower than the average for the previous 10 years. The three-year average for shootings is 25 percent lower. Even in the context of historically low violence, we are sustaining further declines. But we won't stop. To see such dramatic results lasting, to see such dramatic lasting results of our efforts is simply amazing, especially as other large American cities, Chicago, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., to list a few, are experiencing the increases in their homicide rates. The result of all this work are well documented. Over the years, tens of thousands of lives have been saved in New York City. Very real tragedies have been averted. Families have been kept intact. Thanks at least in part to greater public safety, record numbers of tourists are flooding our streets, restaurants, parks, and Broadway shows. Massive real estate investment has tracked the pathways of public safety from Manhattan to the outer boroughs. With medium home prices in Manhattan and Brooklyn, currently at higher levels than the peak of the 2005 to 2008 housing bubble. But while the NYPD achieved what many said was unachievable, making New York the safest big city in America, we have to acknowledge that we did so sometimes at the expense of vital support of some of the communities we swore to protect. We did so sometimes in ways that inflamed old wounds, especially amongst people of color. And those wounds run very deep. Surveys have revealed a decades-long gap between whites and communities of color on approval of their police, a persistent 10-point gap between Latinos and whites, and a stubborn 20-point gap between whites and blacks. It is now our mission to do all we can do to help heal those old wounds and to gain through partnership a new level of public support and public action that achieves our common mission of public safety. Members of every community should feel that they are understood by their police and know they are treated fairly. We need all New Yorkers to view their police through a lens of trust. To address these realities, the realities of success against crime, but the alienation of some communities, we've done several things. We've changed Comstat to no longer drive ever higher number of stops, arrests, and summonses, and instead distinguish those individuals who are a threat from those who are not. And this is something we take very seriously. When I ran Comstat with Dermot Shea every Thursday morning, and the number of hours we spent in prep for this meeting was, was uh, at least three or four hours a week. And it's, as, we, as over the years, the two years that I did this, you just take a look at the very small percentage of population that, that's committing the violence in this city. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it was a quick turnaround for us to see that this is where we needed to focus our resources. Like I said, we know that it's only a small percentage of the population that commits most of the violent crime, and that's the group we're concentrating on with laser-like precision policing. Our targeted enforcement of gangs, crews, and those who sell drugs, steal identities, and manufacture and sell fake credit cards, shoot at each other, and commit other crimes has proven highly successful. We've plucked those criminals from their comfort areas, where they've terrorized good, hard-working people. And we've stabilized neighborhoods where residents and workers were once fearful of walking down their own streets. So while doing this, we've lowered our arrest and some of this activity by 20 percent, while increasing the percentage of stops that leads to gun seizures. We're now focusing our resources on the specific people involved in violence and crime. And when you do that, you're going to meet with pushback and increased resistance. It's probably this intensified scrutiny of criminals that has led to the 22 percent increase in assaults on police officers this year. But to close the gap in trust and approval of the police, we have to do more than eliminate unnecessary enforcement activity. We have to fundamentally change the way we do our business. The NYPD's neighborhood policing program marks the first time any police department anywhere 
is total, totally reorganized to, to deliver the same cops in the same neighborhoods every day. So now we will know members of the community, know the problems, and work together to solve them. Neighborhood policing is now up and running in more than half of the city and all of our commands that cover public housing. The public will soon have the names, email addresses, and increasingly, believe it or not, the cell numbers of the individual police officers who patrol their streets every single day. And I'd like to thank Jesse Tisch for that. Without Jesse, I don't think we would have been able to get 36,000 smartphones to all the men and women of the New York City Police Department. So thank you, Jesse, for that. This is not a repackaged version of prior generations community policing. This is very much a crime fighting model because fighting crime is what we get paid to do. It's what you need us to do. At the same time, we are strengthening the relationship between cops and the people who live and work in every neighborhood. As I tell all of our officers, rookie and veterans alike, New Yorkers in every neighborhood want to see you. They want the police to help them. They're glad we're there on their streets. And I know that for a fact because I was lucky enough to be a precinct commander for six and a half years. So how does the NYPD now chart the way forward, now to get the next, to the next level of where we need to be? On the front page of Friday's New York Times, many of you may have read about 28-year-old Jessica White in the South Bronx. Jessica was sitting, watching her three young kids play on a metal slide just outside her apartment building when gunfire rang out. Jessica left from the playground bench, tried to collect the children, a boy and two girls, ages three, five, and nine. But a bullet tore through Jessica's chest, first killing her. Her children were not injured, but are scarred by what they witnessed and now have to grow up without a mom. Of little solace is the fact that Jessica was not the intended target of a cowardly young man with a gun. That happened in June, and we still haven't made an arrest. Has the NYPD failed Jessica, or has the entire city failed Jessica? That's a very tough question for anyone to answer. What I do know is that the men and women of our detective bureau, particularly in the Bronx, work extremely hard. They have many cases to investigate, and they're absolutely the best in the business. But their interviews of people in the area after the killing yielded almost no new information. And while we did get many tips called in to us after Jessica's murder, in many instances, NYPD's, NYPD posters, believe it or not, advertising a reward for information, and one post is showing a gunman's getaway car were ripped down from telephone poles, lampposts, and public housing development walls. The whole thing reminds me of another case from a long time ago, the 1964 stabbing murder of Kitty Genovese on Austin Street in Queens. The story goes that some neighbors, possibly many neighbors, heard or saw Kitty get attacked twice by the same man but did not call the police. The incident became known as an example of urban indifference and helped bring about the 911 system we have in place today. In both instances, whether driven by indifference or driven by fear, and you have to make that distinction. This is not the New, the New York any of us wants or aspires to be. The clear message is we need every member of the public to help us. This is a shared responsibility. What I'm proposing today is a way for us to find that way forward. Together I want to show this country and Jessica White's family what a galvanized city can deliver. A safe place to work for everyone in every neighborhood on every corner and in every playground. This is the next phase of the NYPD. I'm asking all New Yorkers to engage with their police. Together is the only way we can complete our mission. Police are now only half the equation. Over the last 34 months, we have shifted the NYPD away from a style of policing that has sometimes lost focus on how to best achieve our most basic duty. And that's keeping the people of the city safe. We've now pivoted toward a model of policing that connects better with communities, a plan that not only lowers crime even more, but forges real, lasting relationships with those we serve. Today, we are announcing a large-scale public engagement campaign sponsored by the New York City Police Foundation in Abney. I'd like to thank in particular Bill Rudin and Susan Birnbaum, CEO of the Foundation, and all the Foundation's board members, many of whom are sitting here today. You're our partners in so many breakthrough efforts. 
The goal of the campaign is to get every New Yorker to believe we can make our city safe in every single neighborhood of the city. It's within reach. It's doable. But it depends on everyone doing what they need to do. Cops and community must work in tandem with our partners at the city, state, and federal levels. This campaign will enlist the business community, grassroots community groups, the clergy, academia, the entire criminal justice system, and all relevant public and private agencies to work together with us. It will employ the most powerful elements of traditional and cutting-edge marketing technologies to deliver what is fundamentally not a marketing campaign, but a movement that forges true relationships and delivers what is now possible in New York, perhaps alone among the greatest cities of the world. We will ask every New Yorker to do at least one thing to help us achieve it, such as report crimes that have occurred, be willing to talk to district attorneys, and follow through by testifying in court. We also need to make the process of participating in our criminal justice system as a victim or as a witness safe and less burdensome. And it's important to understand that. We have to make that process safe. This is to all prevent someone else, like Jessica White or Kitty Genovese, from becoming a victim, too. We will also push for more technology in New York City, the kind that will allow the public to text 911 and not just make a voice call so that raw information about criminals, locations of guns, license plates on vehicles used by robbery crews, and more can be sent to us confidentially without the public having to fear retaliation where they live. We will encourage our partners in the judicial, in the judicial system to set high bails for gun offenders and impose meaningful prison sentences for our most violent offenders. We will ask all public and commercial entities to install camera systems that the NYPD can access, enabling us to more quickly view valuable footage and close more investigations. We will ask New Yorkers to take action to prevent crimes, including acts of terrorism, from being committed, and ultimately to help young people from ever committing a first act of violence. I think that's where we really need to concentrate our resources. We'll engage community members who don't usually attend neighborhood meetings. I told you I was a precinct commander for six and a half years, and it's usually the same 40 or 50 people that show up to the meetings. We have to do a lot better than that. We'll ask more people to call our Crime Stoppers tip line. So far this year, we've fielded more than 10,000 calls, but we need more. This is a city of 8.5 million people. The police don't underestimate the difference even one person can make, and neither should the public. This campaign will be orchestrated by Police Foundation Board Member Charles Phillips, CEO of the New York City-based Infor, the third largest business software company in the world. Mr. Phillips will appoint chairs for each aspect of that effort and ask a number of New York's most accomplished filmmakers to invite participation by the creative community of New York, the famous as well as the, those just starting out, and contributing ideas to be chosen for production. As the NYPD moves from a numbers-focused arrest and summons approach to a neighborhood-focused partner and prevent strategy, informed public perception must ignite common commitment to the goal of public safety achieved fairly and justly all throughout New York City. These communication materials distributed in one or more broadcast, print, and social media channels will depict, will depict an authentic reality in the making. That of massive change now occurring with the NYPD in its training, management, and operations and within our neighborhood policing program, in which the entire department is being reorganized to work with community residents to identify and solve the individualized problems that give rise to fear, crime, and disorder. Confront and reduce negative preconceptions and stereotypes of both the police and the diverse communities we serve, and in real time, grid of truth acknowledge the experiences of community residents and of police, enabling everyone to walk in each other's shoes. We've redefined what it means to be a New York City police officer, and the NYPD has reinvented itself. We've conducted a sweeping revision of our strategies, tactics, technology, and training. Now we're asking residents and workers to engage with the criminal justice system and other city agencies to become active partners, in making all neighborhoods safer while simultaneously building trust, and trust is the key component. Every day, the NYPD strives towards the same thing that Abney has embraced as its motto, making New York a better place to live, work, and visit. We're doing this while continuing to strengthen the bond between police and community, while New Yorkers do their part and remain vigilant to stop violence before it starts. Collectively, 
We see the problem we are facing, and we see the opportunity in front of us. And this challenge will be met by one unified city acting together. Please join us. Thank you very much. Commissioner, uh, it is uh, an honor to uh, be up here with you and also uh, formally uh, announce ABNY uh, and ABNY Foundation support for your very, very important initiative. Uh, a gentleman in this room wrote a very interesting book uh, called uh, Collaborate or Perish. I think Bill Bratton will uh, remember that, uh, uh, that he authored that book, and it's all about collaboration uh, in this world that we live in, and I believe everyone in this room uh, uh, and throughout the city will be supporting your uh, really forward-thinking initiative and redefining uh, how the NYPD relates to its uh, community and, and neighbors. And I think it's so fascinating that this is coming from a person who's been in the police department, not somebody from the outside uh, who's really now thought outside the box in terms of collaborating and coming up with this very, very bold plan that has already been rolled out in many neighborhoods and already proving to uh, work. So uh, we wish you the best of luck and you have our uh, commitment to, to work with you. Um, open the floor to questions uh, from uh, anybody here who uh, has a thought. Yes, young lady. Hold on, a mic's coming. I got, I got asked that question in Australia, actually. <laughs> there, were a lot, there were a lot more laughs back, uh, back there. I just listen, my job is uh, to keep this, this city safe. And I've been trying to do this now for 34 years. Um, what I want is, uh, is what's best for the United States of America. So we'll see what happens in November. I think that uh, once we get past the election, um, you know, I think we can stay a little bit more focused on what we need, what we need to do in New York City. Thanks for the question. Really, thank you. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me something like, how many suits do you have now? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I was hoping you would talk a little bit about the predictive use of data and how you are thinking about that as you make these transitions. Well, I'm a, I'm a big believer in technology. I think uh, when Commissioner Bratton and I and the executive staff started this 34 months ago, we were probably behind the curve, well behind the curve as far as using technology. And I think now, uh, today, I think we're, we're way ahead of the curve. So I think uh, using data to predict uh, where crimes are going to be or who's going to commit those crimes, that's, that's something that's not perfected yet, but uh, I'm, I'm someone definitely in favor of using technology uh, to to its uh, highest potential to make sure we keep the city safe. Also has to be balanced with individual freedoms, but uh, I think, uh, we, and I spoke about that small percentage of population that's committing the crimes. So if we can use technology uh, to, to help us do our job better, I'm more in favor of that. I, I just, I think uh, we should also, people in this room and outside the room in, in the technology world, if they have ideas and thoughts, get right to the commissioner and his team, because I think you can be very helpful uh, as, as we move forward and using technology to help help uh, with all these issues. Yes, young lady. Uh, I'm with the Fortune Society, and we work with some of the highest risk young people in the city, who are, I think, among the most likely to end up either being shot or being the shooters. When you talk with them, they see themselves as needing to protect themselves and are more likely to turn to a gang for protection than they are to the police. I think there's an opportunity to undo a legacy of negative interactions, and I think there's a way in which some of the most disaffected young people can be the bellwethers about whether people will come to you or run from you. How do you plan to tackle that issue? Because I think the distinction between the, Kenny, the Kitty Genovese case and the Jessica White case, in, in my opinion, 
is that nobody responded in the Kitty Genovese case. And in this case, I think it's more about a choice about where safety and where loyalty lies. Yeah, and I think it's important that when I, I tried to make that distinct distinction between uh, fear and indifference, and I think a lot of today in 2016 has to do with fear. So I think with the neighborhood policing model, having the same cops in the same sectors every day is going to go a long way to making that connection. And in each one of those sectors, we have neighborhood coordination officers, and their job is to make sure that they they're the conduit between the, the community and the cops. And it, the community is not just the business community and the residents. So much of what happens in New York City has to do with our youth. So a lot of our focus is going to be on the youth. No more questions? Yes, young lady right here, last question. Depends on how difficult they are. <laughs> I'm a former um, MIPH lawyer, and I was wondering if how are you going to is that going to be a big focus this year? Because I heard um, last year that wasn't going to be a big focus. Um, and my second question is uh, as a new college, which is a problem area, and I was wondering if you're going to make it uh, full control more important than car control. The, the officers there seem to rather than And I'll, I'll do the second question first. That's actually, uh, do you live in the 100 or the 101? The 101. That's actually part of our, one of the first precincts we started in the neighborhood policing program. So I'm going to have to talk to Inspector Lenz. There should be more people out on foot in the 101. So I'll, I'll check into that. Actually, the chief of patrol is here today, Terry Monahan. So I'll have him check into that. <laughs> and then as, as far as the Explorer program, like I said, uh, I was a precinct commander for, for a long time. I had explorers in, in the, the park. I had a few explorers in the 2-5, and I had a tremendous amount of explorers in the 4-4, so I'm a big believer in the program. Final question from uh, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Gail, good morning. Thank you very much. Just so you know, uh, the explorers in PSA 5 need uniforms, sir. I was with them yesterday. Just for you. Um, my question is, when you have these wonderful... Hey, Gail, what size are they? I have about 30 shirts and pants. <laughs> it might be a little big, though, that I don't get to wear anymore. Um, the issue is when you have the uh, wonderful neighborhood policing, one of the issues that I encounter, and I do spend a lot of time with them, and they are phenomenal, is when they run into an issue that might be considered uh, something that a human service agency works on and so on, that's a little bit of a gap, and it's a hard gap to fill because you, you have a list of what the youth programs are, what the senior programs are, and so on. But I think it needs updating, and I'm just wondering how you want to make that connection because certainly they're doing a great job on talking to the uh, shopkeepers and so on, but they run into problems and they want to solve them. And I think that needs some updating. I'm wondering if you've had any uh, issues or concerns or ideas about that. And I did not ask Gail to ask me this question. This is, this is what I, when I was speaking about, that it's not just the NYPD. It's got to be so much more than the NYPD. Of course, it's got to be the residents. It's got to be the businesses. But it's also got to be the other city, city agencies. As our NCOs and our sector cops identify problems and look to solve them, we have to make sure that we have that cooperation. So we, uh, we just appointed, uh, uh, we just actually promoted Rodney Harrison. He was the investigative chief in Brooklyn North. He's now the two-star chief in Terry Monahan's office, his is XO. So he's going to be running with this program and make sure that all the other city agencies are, uh, are, are there when we need them and we can solve the problems together. Commissioner, as I said before, we are here to help you and your entire department, and we wish you the best of luck. And uh, thank you for being here for your second speech, but first speech in New York. And, uh, We'll see all of you uh, uh, next Friday for the mayor. Thank you. For